Hello everyone, welcome back to day five of Bitwise, where we build a complete software hardware stack for a computer from scratch. Um, so where we left off on day four, if, if uh, you recall, uh, we had a mainstream where we started, I think we, we did a bunch of work on a, uh, on, you know, a quote unquote final lecture, not really final, but a fairly broad lexer for uh, for ION, and then uh, we did a sort of optional extra stream after that. Uh, you can see the links here for day four, where um, the main topic was, let's see, what, what did we do? Yeah, the main topic was really um, kind of designing the grammar uh, in detail, like actually designing sort of from, from an empty page, designing the EBNF grammar and working through it. And then from there, um, you know, actually designing and, and implementing the, the basic C data structures to represent uh, the different uh, syntactic uh, results, uh, the, the, the abstract syntax tree nodes and so on, um, resulting from, from the eventual parsing. And uh, just to contextualize that, you might wonder why we didn't jump into parsing directly. Uh, what, one of the, the major keys there is that um, if you want to do a real parser for a non-trivial language, you need a way to test it. Um, if you go and write 500 lines of code, but then you don't have any reasonable way of testing it, um, then by the time you actually have a way of testing it, you will, your, your brain will have totally forgotten about the minutia. And so as, as you start finding bugs, it's going to, you're going to have to get up to speed on all the details in order to resolve those bugs. But um, if you instead put in place enough of the prerequisites for testing before you start developing it, it means that you can actually, uh, you know, even as you're developing the pieces of the parser, you can effectively uh, test it very easily. And so the approach I decided to take there, and I'll just review that um, now. And, and actually, let, let me say something about today's uh, stream structure, because th this thing I'm about to jump into is going to be step one of that. Uh, so basically, my plan is to review all the code uh, we wrote uh, in the in the last few days. So, so the the TLDR is that we have a working parser and AST printer for basically the full language. Uh, working meaning it works for my test cases. Um, I need to do much more extensive testing, but uh, it's basically solid except for, you know, like even the bugs I've found since the original uh, commit have been uh, just sort of like small typo level stuff. So I, I'm pretty confident that um, that it's kind of like 90% there. Uh, obviously doesn't do good error, hand, uh, doesn't do good error recovery and error messages and stuff. It's, it's rough in that sense, but it's functional. Um, and so my, my idea today is basically just to go through the high points of that code and kind of explain um, how it re maybe relates to stuff we've covered earlier uh, in previous days uh, and things that might be non obvious and also design choices I've made and also uh, changes to existing code that that I made to accommodate the new code. Um, and so let's just uh, cover sort of uh, the conclusion of the uh, of the extra stream since I figure most people didn't watch it. It was a very long stream. Um, and also I've refactored the code since then to be much cleaner. So let's jump over to Visual Studio. Um, uh, the, the first thing to note about physical organization, and this started already in the extra stream, is that rather than just having one big .c file, I started splitting things out. Um, but I've split things out in a way that's still compilable as a single uh, compilation unit. So for example, um, if I, not bit pull, git pull. Um, if I, uh, this is on my Linux box where I'm pulling from the same repo. If I just uh, compile main.c, uh, main um, that's the whole the whole program, and I can run it, and uh, you can you can get the output. Um, so, kind of a the, the next evolution in the physical organization from what we had originally, where everything was concatenated in one file. Um, basically, I now have separate files, but um, the way it works is that you have the main.c file, and that's the only one that actually includes other stuff. So even the the, the header files that are common uh, are pulled out into main.c, and then they're included basically in dependency order. So because this is a compiler, um, you don't have a lot of cyclic dependencies, so there's not a lot of intermodule. Uh, currently, there's no intermodule for declarations required, and so I just basically have sort of the dependency order right here, um, and that way that's kind of pulled up to the top level and the individual modules don't have to worry about uh, that stuff. Uh, and then you can see I just have a main dot, a main underscore test that calls the test functions for the various modules. Um, and so for example, uh, ast.h has all the, 
has all the data structure definitions for uh, abstract syntax tree nodes. So these represent, you know, the different kind of syntactic entities like statements, uh, expressions, and declarations. And um, I'm not going to go over the code because there's uh, in detail because a lot of it is very repetitive and it's pretty self-explanatory. I will just cover uh, the high points. But in terms of physical organization, what I wanted to emphasize is the nice thing about doing what I did here is that each of the .c and .h files can be extremely um, pared down. They don't have include guards or uh, their own pound and recursive pound includes or any other stuff like that. They can really just be um, a way of organizing code into logical chunks without worrying about the dependency structure, at least within those chunks. You can pull all that up into the main.c. Uh, and it, it also means that the build system is easy to deal with. You just have a single .c file. People can just write this on the command line. You don't even need a build script. Uh, I normally don't write build scripts for this stuff until they're kind of product, like until they've stabilized and I want to do, uh, you know, kind of a release or something. So uh, during development, this is how I like to do things. But anyway, let's go over some of the AST stuff. Like I said, each of these data structures represents uh, some some result or sub result of of parsing, uh, you know, a statement or an expression or a declaration. Um, earlier, I talked. I mentioned discriminated unions, uh, AKA tagged unions. Uh, and this is a very strong example of that. Um, so to, to refresh your memory, if we go back to, um, uh, to our token struct from way back, you remember it has a kind field that sort of says what kind of token is it? And then for some of those kinds, there's additional auxiliary data and these are all in an anonymous union. So if you have a token int, there's an associated int val. If it's a token float, there's a float val, and so on and so on. Uh, so that was kind of a simple case of that. That's a, a tagged union. Um, and the idea is we have this kind field, and based on, you know, we do a switch on the kind field to decide what kind of node it is, and then if it's a certain kind of node, we will read these uh, auxiliary fields to, to get additional data. Uh, and that same structure applies uh, even more so to ASTs. They're kind of a, a canonical use case for tagged unions. So um, let me maybe go to something that's a little more familiar. If you see a declaration, a decal, uh, so this represents a top level declaration, you can see a declaration has a kind. So, uh, you know, the kind is none, which is, means an invalid declaration, enum, struct, union, var, const, type, def, func. Um, and then it has a name because all, all declarations have names. So that's all the common stuff. And then we have the stuff that's discriminated between them. Uh, which is, you know, if you have an, uh, an enum, then you have a bunch of enum decal data. If you have an aggregate, which covers both structs and unions, then you have an aggregate uh, field for funks, type def, and so on. And so, for example, if you look at, um, I mean, you can, you can see it right up here. It's kind of self-explanatory. Um, if you have a type def, then beyond the name, the only thing you need to know is the, the type that you're type defing a name to. If you have uh, an enum decal, then you have a list of enum items, and each of those items has a name and an optional uh, initialization expression. You know, if this is left out, the init expression, that means to just use the sequential numbering from the from the previous entry and so on. So that's kind of the recurring theme here. Uh, I'm not going to go over um, all the different cases because the structure is extremely uh, you know, well, you could say it's repetitive, but you could say it's uniform really, right? Like it's the same idea repeated again and again. Um, and that's not a coincidence. When you have this kind of code that is uh, inherently has a lot of parallel structure, you want to make sure the your actual code reflects that, uh, that it doesn't look sort of like the different cases are widely different when they're actually very parallel. So I tried to kind of use naming conventions and, and kind of code layout to, to reinforce that. Um, so yeah, you can see for an expression, we have the same deal. Uh, if you have a literal expression, then you have a literal value associated with it. If you have a name expression, there's a name. And then for these more complex expression types, there's more complex associated data. Um, and same for statements, same exact thing for statements. So this is the standard way of doing this stuff in functional languages and also sort of when you write stuff by hand. Um, in case you've ever seen people write uh, compilers in an object-oriented style, you will sometimes see people use subclasses um, for this sort of stuff. Where you have a you know you have a, a base class for say statement and then you have a subclass for return statement break statement and so on, um, you know that 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 may or may depending on the language that may be a convenient way to do it but certainly in C um, 
that that would require additional scaffolding and in any case i don't think it's really a good idea but um, in case you have seen that before i did want to make the connection to the subclassing approach like for example if you look at um, you know if you look at a, a, a simple compilers in something like scala or or i guess even java or python or something it's quite possible they will use um I guess Scala would use case classes rather than traditional OO subclasses, but kind of, you know, like, so just, just in case you've seen that, that that's sort of the equivalent. And in that case, uh, rather than doing a switch statement on the, on the kind and to distinguish the cases, you would often use virtual functions that are dispatched based on the subclass. So that's kind of an alternative approach, but this is, uh, I would say more the functional programming approach or the, just the kind of barehanded approach. Um, so this is really straightforward. Uh, it really just reflects, you know, logically all the different types of, of of syntactic entities and all their associated data uh, and then this is i think an important point is that um you know there's a there's a lot of different especially with the tagged unions in c you really don't want people um to to have to manually initialize the fields because there's a fairly complex invariance uh that that may not uh be that are easy to, to make mistakes for so for example the invariant here is if you have a, a kind of a given type first off it needs to have a name and then depending on the kind the corresponding enum decal uh, must be filled in um so you you know for example if you have an enum decal but you can't you know you should be accessing things only through this field both for the initialization and for the subsequent uh, processing um, and so to, uh, to avoid people having to sort of manually initialize structures and be very painstaking about um, not touching the wrong things and so on, uh, it's important that you have uh, kind of helpers to deal with that. Um, and as you'll see, it makes the code much more, uh, much clearer and more compact. So leaving this aside for now, I'll get to some of this stuff later. But uh, AST alloc is just a way of allocating memory that's associated with the AST. Don't worry about uh, this arena stuff for now. Um, but basically what we have for the rest of it is we just have constructor functions for um, the different cases of these uh, tagged unions. So there's a, a kind of a baseline constructor for, um, for allocating, uh, for, well, let's take something maybe more familiar like the decal. Um, yeah, so you provide for a decal, the, the baseline constructor takes a kind and a name, which are the mandatory fields and initializes those. And then depending on the specific uh, kind of decal, you can see that we have a constructor function that takes exactly the data that you need to initialize uh, this kind of decal and, you know, no more or no less. And so not only does this cut down on the code you have to write, um, but it also means that you, you just need one place for the initialization that has to get right exactly what to initialize. So every time you're you're creating an enum in your parser, uh, you don't have to remember exactly what fields to initialize and so on. You can kind of centralize that. Um, and so that just recurs for all the different cases. You have um, you you have uh, you know constructors for each different kind. And so that's pretty repetitive, but it's straightforward code. Um, so you can see some of the more complicated cases like ifs, there's more parameters, but essentially the same structure. Um, and, and languages that have support for tagged unions natively, like uh, functional languages, would obviously obviate this kind of code. But since we're writing low-level, kind of bare-handed bare code, uh, you have to do this stuff yourself unless you want to use macros. Um, but I think this is below my threshold for, for macro uh, automation. So anyway, that's, that's basically the reasoning there. Um, and then the great thing about this is that, uh, and I guess I should show that, um, is that when you're trying to construct expressions, for example, you can just do, or, or yeah, let's look at this. When you're trying to construct uh, AST nodes, you can just use this very compositional style that reads extremely naturally. So if I want to, for example, construct, you know, if I want to construct the equivalent of one plus two, um, I use expert binary to construct a binary expression node. I say, I want to have a plus for the operator. And then I say, left operand is an expert int uh, one, and this is an expert int two. So by, by having these constructor uh, functions for that, you can write this kind of compositional code where you don't have, a, you, know, you don't need a ton of intermediate variables to initialize stuff and then hook it up. You just kind of compose it like with sub expressions, which is a huge win in the parser. Um, and so you can see this just recurs for all these different cases 
Um, this is what you want your code to look like, right? Like you should judge an API by what the use cases look like. And this is basically where you want to end up. So this is nothing revolutionary, but I've seen people do AST and C where they're doing a ton of manual, you know, they're ra rather than doing this sort of stuff, they might be like, okay, let's, let's first, uh, let's first allocate, you know, let's first allocate an expression and then, okay, w what kind is it? I guess it's a, a binary and, oh, what, what do I have to fill in for binary? Well, I guess I have to fill in the operator and, uh, oh, and, you know, and so on. So like you end up with this kind of code that's very flat and uh, very flat. It's extremely, um, it's extremely verbose and it really hides the natural structure of the AST you're constructing, whereas this is just a direct reflection of that. So, so that's kind of the motivation behind this. Um, and, and the same thing is true for statements, but statements have much more complex structure nested. Like, you know, if you're trying to construct a, uh, an if statement with, uh, you know, both if else and else if clauses, then there's more data that has to be filled in, but essentially the same thing applies there for how that looks. Um, so, so that's it for the AST and the construction functions and, and that API and why it's designed the way it is. Um, the thing I, started I, I finished one part of on the extra stream but then didn't um well and then finished later uh, after the stream uh, in the same day is ast printing so i mentioned that one of the main motivations for doing the ast first before the parser is that we want to have a good way of debugging the parser and so the idea here is that um we basically want some kind of printer or formatter that will take a uh, an ast node so you know either a declaration um or an expression or a statement and print it out in some human readable way. And um, I'm using as expression syntax here, which is, you know, like Lisp, um, because it's, it's, it's familiar, it's kind of easy to scan once, you, once you're used to it uh, as a human. Um, and it's fairly compact. It's not super verbose um, compared to, I don't know, so certainly some AST printing uh, code I've seen. And um, the other nice thing about it is if we're ever writing, a, 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 and we will, if we're writing test code um, and we're trying to do test regression stuff, uh, then we can not only do kind of uh, literal character by character text matching, but we can parse it as an S expression without actually knowing the internal structure and do structure matching at the S expression level. So it has a bunch of wins. Um, and it also just serves, uh, I hopefully for, for, for you people watching, it serves as a first example of how you traverse an AST recursively to do some processing. So, so we already did this in homework. Um, we already did this uh, in homework, uh, homework one day two, uh, except that it was for you know just the, this very simple expression language. But now we're doing it for the full AST, uh, for the full grammar. Um, and so there's really not much to say about this code. It's just recursively uh, visiting. So, you know, if if uh, if you're trying to print an enum declaration, you say, okay, well. Uh, print that enum tag and then the name of the enum declaration iterate through the enum items and for each of them you uh, you, 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 you know you, you print the name and if there's an associated initializer expression you print that otherwise you print nil to signify that there's no initializer expression and so on uh, and all of this is done with indentation um, so that anytime there's a print new line anywhere in this code it gets intent indented according to the indent uh, variable which is a global um, and the same is true for all of these other cases. Um, so, if, so maybe if you want to look at uh, print expert, which is the um, the pretty printer for expressions, this is kind of the simplest case, and it covers a lot of stuff. So you can see for all the different literal types, it just prints out the thing directly with printf. Uh, by the way, right now I'm not doing proper escaping uh, for quoted strings, uh, just because that's that's a bit of a digression, and I don't really care to do it right now. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and so it's just recursive. You just have these different printer functions for different types of nodes. And so you just call them recursively, use printf to concatenate stuff. Um, you know, it's about as straightforward as it gets. Hopefully this is just a, a more uh, elaborate version of what you did in the first homework for your simple expression parser. Um, but, uh, the, the net result of this is that, um, let me now, I'll go over the parser, but let me just fast forward to the test code so you can see what this looks like when you print. Um, when you have a bunch of declarations like this, uh, 
then the way we test them is we first parse them into an AST node and then we print it and we just do that for now. Um, and so then actually let me front load some of the simpler stuff, like maybe this one. Um, so then if you, you know, it, par it parses and then we print it. And so this is what you get for this declaration. So this says, you know, we have a var declaration. The name of the declaration is X. Nil means it has no specified type. It's inferred. Uh, and then you have a ternary expression. Let me just move this so you can see the original up here. And uh, it compares B to one. And if that is true, then we compute uh, one plus two. Otherwise, we, we compute uh, three minus four. Sorry, someone's sending me stuff on Facebook. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of the idea behind the pretty printer and how that works. And you can see how it plays out here uh, for more elaborate cases. Um, let's see, so that's the first one. For more elaborate cases like a function, you can see we have indentation. So let me just move this. Um, um, you can see, I just wrote all of this on one line because it's a C string. Um, but here you can actually see it formatted where, you know, func fact. So we have a function declaration of something called fac. The first argument is an int and it returns an int. And then there's a statement block. And the first uh, statement in the statement block is a call to a function called trace with an argument fact as a uh, fact as a, uh, as a, as a string quoted thing. And then you have an if block and it checks, you know, is n is zero, blah, 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 return one uh, and so on. And here's the nested sub expression for the recursion. Um, and so that's the idea for that. That's that's the that that's how the, the the pretty printing works out once you've actually constructed an AST node of some sort. So you can hopefully see how this is very useful for testing. If we had to do the equivalent, I mean, let me maybe show it to you. If we had to do the equivalent sort of uh, human uh, eyeballing of the result, let me show you what that looks like and why that's uh, too painful to really seriously consider. Um, so here we just uh, parsed and printed the simple declaration. Uh, th this case is maybe too simple to really make the point that the complexity is overwhelming, um, but uh, especially because you know C doesn't really have tag union support and the the, uh, the debugger doesn't know about tag unions. You kind of have to know exactly what you're doing here. So you say, okay, it's a variable and it's called X. And then we have to go down here and it's like, okay, it doesn't have a specified type. Oh, and it's, initialization expression is ternary and oh, okay. And then what's the oh ternary down here? And okay, so the condition, okay. So you can see how even for simple expressions like this, it's impossible to uh, quickly get a sense of what's going on in the debugger. So that's one of the, the main selling points of this uh, for human validation. Um, but like I said, automated testing will also be much easier with this sort of thing. All right, so hopefully that explains um, that explains the AST construction and printing. Uh, I, oh, I should also mention, uh, on the extra stream, we developed uh, the, 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 a loose sketch of the EBNF grammar, and it's in the syntax.txt file if you want to check it out in the repo. Um, the, the way we developed this was just kind of incremental, just thinking through the different cases and using our knowledge of C for, for most of it, and then only really deviating for the uh, ion-specific parts. Um, and when I sat down to write the parser last night, you know, honestly, the parser was almost the easiest part to write of anything I've done so far for, for ION. Like there was a bunch of code, but it's extremely rote once you have a basic idea of the grammar. This grammar isn't complete. And so I did have to cover additional details. Like just as I wrote it, I, I was forced to think through them, but just having a rough sketch of this on one monitor while I was writing the parser in the, uh, on the other screen made it basically a cakewalk. Uh, and so, yeah, we developed this, uh, and this is not complete or accurate. I think there's still a few bugs here that were fixed in the code. But this is the kind of thing we wrote out uh, incrementally on on the extra stream. Uh, and you can see for some of the cases, I, uh, I wrote down some kind of illustrations for myself to, uh, to drive my thinking. Um, and this is also what, by the way, drove the creation of the different AST nodes, because you kind of look at the different cases and you say for each of them, well, does that correspond to a distinct AST node or is there a commonality? 
uh, and that, so that helps you kind of drive uh, the AST data struct definitions. So for example, for the uh, expression grammar, uh, you have a lot of different binary operators. You want all of those to be represented the same way in the AST as just being a binary operator. Um, but in the concrete syntax of this EBNF, you obviously need to distinguish them in order for the precedence to work out. Um, but for most of the nodes, there's a pretty one-to-one -one relationship between productions and AST node types, uh, except for these cases, like I just mentioned, especially operator precedence where you want to collapse it. But uh, this is just a really good way to drive the development. Um, and it doesn't have to be exact, like I said, it just needs to sort of force you to think about the next step. And then once you're actually forced to implement it, uh, it will uh, it will force you to kind of uh, dot the I's and cross the T's and so on. Um, and so this is this is the workflow that I recommend for developing grammars and uh, uh, and associated parsers and, and ASTs. So anyway, popping the stack. Um, so having done that last night, I uh, I sat down after a little bit of preliminary stuff and uh, I just wrote the and just wrote the parser basically, just starting at, at, at declarations and, and working my way down the list. Um, and so you know for declarations, here's the EBNF we wrote. So you can see that each of these productions is is discriminated by a uh, a keyword, and so the corresponding parse function is really just saying, can I if if I if I match an enum, then parse an enum declaration, blah blah blah, right? Like just going through the list. Um, and so for example, uh, let's take a simple uh, let's take a simple declaration like a const declaration. So if we see a const keyword, um, then we go in here and we say, well, after const, we expect a, a name of a declaration. And so we call bus parse name. Then we expect a, a, an equality sign for, for the initialization. That's not optional. Uh, and then we recursively parse an expression for the right-hand side. And having uh, this thing returns an, a pointer to an expression for that AST node. And then having that, we just call this, uh, you know, the one of the constructor functions we covered earlier, we just call that with the arguments. So you can see how this code is, uh, this is obviously a simple function for parsing, but you can see how by kind of factoring out the, the right pieces like the AST construction functions in a way that corresponds to the logical structure of the AST, we have this very nice clean parsing code where, you know, there's a one-to-one -one relationship between the you know parse decal const construct both, both parses and constructs a decal const, so it's just like all the parallelism in terms of the names and the meanings, um, and the sort of you know this expression-oriented compositional style of constructing things and parsing things, really uh, really helps keep things concise and uh, bug-free. Uh, and again, this is if you're used to doing functional language parsing or like you're, you've written parsers in Python, this is uh, how you do it. But I do want to highlight it because I've seen a lot of C parsers that, like I said, take this very kind of flat approach where they manually initialize data structures every time and fill in each of the fields one by one by one. Uh, and that completely hides the actual meaning of the code by um, polluting it with junk about exactly how to fill in each field so it, it starts looking more like flat assembly code than uh than you know c code um and and you know it should be said that basically all of all, all of the helpers are going to get inlined and if they don't get inlined as we expect you can force them to be inlined and so this is not really a performance cost uh, you just have to validate that the compiler ends up doing what you hope to what, what you hope it's doing uh and, and if not force its hand but anyway, so that, so that's the idea. So you can basically just, I'm not going to go over all of these, but I'll probably pick out a few strategic cases. Uh, probably one that's fun to see is the expression parser because you're going to see how it mirrors what we already did. Um, so there's a top level function for expression parsing just called parse expert. And if you go to the, um, and if you go to this, um, it's exactly the structure. So it's it's doing precedence climbing where it's starting at the lowest precedence, which is return aries. Um, <clears throat> it's it, it's doing you know, it, it's going up 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 the precedence hierarchy, and then on the way down, it's trying to glom on additional stuff. Um, and so this this corresponds straightforwardly to what we've done before. You can see for some of these, there's only a, a single operator at that precedence level, and for others, uh, there's a set of possibilities like a comp. Uh, this is for any comparison type op uh, operation. Um, 
and so you can see we just have a set of alternatives here. It could be less than, greater than, equality, not uh, equals, not equals, less than or equals, greater than or equals, and so on. And so this structure just recurs for those different levels. Uh, and now if you go over and look at the code, um, for now, I'm even, you know, I'm even though I normally hate C code like this, I did it just in order to maintain the parallelism between the grammar, the logical structure, and the um, and the code. And, and this is going to get inlined, um, but normally this would make me a little bit uncomfortable. Uh, but I think here it's probably warranted. Uh, and then you can see if you flip back and forth, um, ternary says, oh, we need an or expression and then an optional uh, optional question mark. And so here we. Uh, we parse an or expression, and then we parse an optional question mark. And if there is a question mark, then we need uh, another ternary expression for the then part, and then uh, a mandatory colon for the else part. And we parse that. And then when we're done, uh, you'll see this pattern here. We actually replace in place the, we reassign this pointer expert to the new result. And so there's only one return site here, which is this. Um, for this particular case, that doesn't matter too much, but uh, you can see when we're doing um, left associative parsing for operators, it does actually matter. So for example, for this, uh, parse expert or, let's look at what it looks like. So we first have to parse an AND expression and then optionally a sequence of uh, or ORs followed by AND expressions. So you can see this is exactly what it says. We part, parse the AND expression recursively, and then in a loop, as long as we can match an OR token, then we consume that, and we recursively parse an AND expression again. And then when we've done that, we construct a, you know, the binary expression node corresponding to that, and we reassign it to expert. And so if I'm writing it sort of in an S expression term, suppose I'm parsing um, something like this. Um, when we call parse expert and, it's going to give back the a, uh, the a, and then we're going to see an or, and uh, it's going to um, parse, uh, you know, the parse expert and in this line is going to hit, and it's going to then consume the b, and so the inter the, the first result is going to so first we have a, and then we have uh, we have this, and then we have this after that line executes. And then uh, we have this after the, the third, or sorry, the after the third expression is consumed, uh, after the second or operator is consumed. Um, and so that's the idea behind this kind of in-place uh, reassignment. Uh, that works out. That's what I called a left fold. That's a functional programming term. I covered left folds in the Q&A for, I think, day three. So that's the same thing we did for the calculator when we were doing a simple uh, expression calculator. Now here, rather than immediately computing the result, we're constructing the AST node corresponding to the result. So um, I think that's the main thing I wanted to cover in terms of um, of the operator parsing. Uh, but you can, you can see if you just go up, uh, and you can see I've factored out this stuff uh, when you have sets of possible operators. I factor that into uh, these simple Boolean predicate functions. Um, I should mention that this is we're probably going to optimize this. I plan to do optimization maybe today or tomorrow, um, do some benchmarking now that we can do proper end-to-end -end parsing tests. Um, but this is the sort of thing where having to do all these checks um, is, is, is a little bit uh, uh, excessive, and we'll see what, what, if any, impact it has on performance and whether we can do stuff to, to help it by um, using token classes to classify things into groups. Um, and it turns out we can by organizing the enums to be consecutive so that everything of a given precedence is numerically consecutive and so on. But uh, for now, I've just left it as it is, and it corresponds, as you can see, is comp up corresponds exactly to this line here. It can be less than, greater than, EQ, not EQ, LT, uh, GTEQ, LTEQ. So one-to-one uh, -one relationship between the grammar and the code, which is how it should be. Um, and that just continues up the hierarchy. Um, one thing we didn't cover explicitly, or that is maybe worth mentioning, is that the way um, people often don't think of it this way, but in, in languages like C, and actually most languages, um, the way function calls um, and subscripting for arrays and field accesses uh, are done actually is parsed exactly like a left associative binary operator. So 
you can see it here. If you look at this, uh, if you look at this base ac expression, you can see it parses an operand expression, um, and then you know zero or more of these. You know, it can either be a function call or a subscript or a field access, and they're basically parsed in a left associative way, in, in much the same way you would do uh, a binary operator parse that's left associative. The the main the main difference is that while the left hand side uh, follows the rule we've set so far, the right hand side is a little more general, right? So if you're doing a function call, uh, it's not only like you know, first off, it's parenthesized, so the presence is not the same. Uh, it could be you know like a top level presence. Um, but you can also have, you know, commas for function calls and so on. Uh, and in the case of uh, field access, the thing that follows the dot can't be an arbitrary expression. It has to be a flat name. But other than that, um, the basic way you recognize and do the construction is left associative, just like you do for the binary operators. Um, so, for example, for function calls or maybe let's take subscripts. Um, you can see we recursively parse uh, an operand, an expression operand. And then we check whether we have one of these guys. And then if, and again, this is a little bit inefficient because we first check which, uh, whether it's one we want to handle and then we actually check them again to, to distinguish what case, but for now that was a little bit simpler. And so you can see if we, uh, if we match uh, an open bracket for subscript, uh, then we recursively parse the index expression uh, and expect the closing uh, close bracket, and then we construct an index expression. Expression again, this, again in this kind of reassigning expert in this left associative, left folding way. Uh, and so that, so 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 all, so if you've internalized this idea behind left associative, left folding parsing, um, this is just the gift that give. It's a very simple idea. It's a gift that keeps on giving. It's basically what we do uh, ninety percent of the time in the expression grammar. Uh, and then there's the base case. Um, the base case is handling the literals. Uh, handling um, names, and you can see in some case, like if you parse a name, it can either just be like a variable reference, but if the name is followed by a curly brace, this is actually a compound expression, and so we recursively parse that, uh, and we will interpret that name as actually specifying a type. If it's a, um, if it's just, a, if, if the expression starts with a curly brace, then we have an untyped or implicitly typed compound expression. So, for example, um, you know, if you have uh, if you have var uh, like this and you do something like this, you can infer from v having an explicit type that um, that the compound uh, the compound expression must must specify a, a compound literal of type vector, and so that's why you can leave that out in certain contexts. Uh, and so syntactically, it's always valid, but semantically, it's only valid in explicitly uh, or in in, in contexts in, in which the expected type can be inferred. Um, and then for um, this is something I should talk about since this was an extra stream item that I haven't talked about before. Um, if if you see a, a, an open paren, then you normally just parse it as a you know a, a grouped expression. Um, and you can see that corresponds to this production here. Um, but but if uh, um, so, let me let me pop the stack a little bit. This is going to to, to cover stuff we already covered in the extra stream a little bit, but I'll do it more quickly. Um, one of the big problems in C that I mentioned earlier when we covered some of the design criteria for ION on day, day one um, is that you don't necessarily know in a given context whether you're dealing with um, wh whether you're dealing with a uh, an expression or a, a type specifier, and this means that C typically often needs to know uh, whether a given identifier signifies a type def or uh, a, not a type def in order to know how to parse the rest of the stream from that point on. Uh, and so since we don't want to require that kind of simple table data in order to resolve the uh, the syntax tree, um, we, we we do things a little differently. I mean, first off, we have this kind of syntax um, where the um, where the type specifiers always follow in a declaration always follows a uh, a, cent a colon, but um, it also means um, in some contexts, like you know, if you have a uh, a compound literal like this, this actually only so vector here specifies a type, but actually this only works when we have what what I call a simple type, which is just a type corresponding to a, a name. Um, but this wouldn't work, for example, if you had something like this, um, something weird like this, um, 
you know, like an array of 16 pointers to vectors and, and you would have like PQR and, and so on. Um, that wouldn't work with this notation because by the time you've seen vector, you you still think you're looking at an expression and you don't know whether this is like a binary operator or something else. And then when you see this, like you can sometimes try to do speculative look ahead, but you can construct cases that require unbounded look ahead and it just completely destroys any semblance of coherence in the parser if you try to do something like that. So in order to avoid that, uh, I basically support this simple un uh, untagged um, use case for compound literals. But if you want to specify a completely general type, you have to use this notation with uh, open paren colon. So this is a prefix colon, which is mnemonic in the same way uh, for the same, you know, it's, it's similar to how the colon is used to set off types in these declarations and also in colon equals. Um, and then you can, you can first off write this, which is just a synonym um, for previous line. Um, but then in the cases where you have more complex stuff, um, you can write um, vector uh, star 16 like this. Or maybe I'll just say three. Um, so this is this was the best, uh, after trying a bunch of different notations long, you know, months ago when I was thinking about this for the first time, this is what I came up with. The idea is basically any time where uh, in an expression context uh, where uh, you would want to specify a general type um, you have two options. You can either just use a flat type name if, if, if that suffices, or for a general type specifier, you have to use this sort of, uh, I've been calling it the burger notation, but maybe I should call it the happy face notation. I don't know why I think of it as a burger, but this to me looks kind of like a burger. Um, but anyway, um, and there's a similar case of this in size of where um, you can see up here that if you use size of it with an expression, you can just use it without any uh, tagging. But if you want to use it for a type specifier, you have to set it off with this prefix uh, colon. So I thought that was an important bit of syntax to cover, just the motivation and and, and why the obvious, seemingly obvious uh, better alternatives are actually not really feasible. Uh, although, I, I mean, obviously I could have overlooked even better options, but certainly the naive solutions to this problem don't work. Uh, and this is why we're doing what we're doing. But then, yeah, popping the stack, when we, what we were looking at here, um, that's why this is here. So you can see that if we see an open paren followed by a colon, then we expect a type, and we then expect a compound literal following that. So that covers the case of, you know, of something like this in an expression context. Um, so I think that's it for expressions. Types are pretty straightforward. Um, the syntax is here. So it's the same kind of expression parsing you've, you guys have seen before now many times, uh, left associative, etc. So we have a base type can either be a name or it can be a funk. So for example, if you want to declare a funk, uh, taking an integer and returning an integer, it will look like this. Um, and so if you wanted to do something <clears throat> like this, that would be fine. Um, it could also be parenthesized, which is just a way of overriding the precedence. And so the case where you need that is, uh, unfortunately, it's very rarely needed in practice, unlike C, where sometimes, well, it's very rarely needed in practice. Um, but, but let me show you the case where it's needed. Um, suppose you write, um, suppose you write uh, something like this in, in 16, I don't know. I mean, uh, in 16 return values in C are a little bit wonky anyway. Returning arrays is, yeah. Let's let's not worry too much about the, the whole weirdness with uh, array and pointer decay when you're dealing with uh, return values, I guess. Um, but but anyway, uh, suppose you have this. Oh, that's not right. Um, so this said uh, this this type def's a function that takes one integer and returns not 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 it, well it returns an array of sixteen integers but not really because of the whole pointer decay uh, or array decay stuff but but let's just uh, say that for now um, the uh, the the problem is suppose I want to have an array of function pointers where each function pointer type is goes from int to int um, I could use a type def auxiliary type def um, but you shouldn't ever have to use auxiliary type defs like just there should be an alternative. So you can always write it like this. Um, and so that's supported and it's, and you could use it optionally in any context. So you could also just write this, right? Like you could, you could use as many parentheses as you want 
it doesn't have any meaning in terms of changing the type. It's just a way of um, of, of controlling the parsing. Um, but in practice, this almost never happens because arrays of function pointers or pointers to function pointers uh, is uncommon. Like it's not a common case. Uh, I should mention, by the way, semantically, I am going to define func. I'm go this is going to be a function pointer type, even though you, you don't you don't have to do this to get a function pointer type. Um, my plan is to disallow, even though C does it, my plan is to not have a notion of a non-pointer function type. Uh, I'm just going, because that's, that's a notorious mess in C anyway, and people normally don't make the distinction very much. And it has some weird corner cases in the semantics that are not really pitfalls, but are just kind of silly. So I'm defining the meaning of these function types as having, you know, their pointer, function pointer types. Uh, so you don't have to do this for a function pointer type. You just do this. And given that that's the case, how often do you have arrays of function pointers? Not all that often. Okay, when you do, uh, you can do this. It's a few extra lines of code. I think it's perfectly clear. Um, and, and this is also pretty clear. Like the binding of the uh, square brackets to the int, I think is pretty syntactically evident on the page. So I feel like given that we want this postfix notation in order to mimic C type syntax, uh, I feel like this was the right choice, even though it does require parentheses. Anyway, um, so that's some some background on on how on why I ended up doing the syntax this way for types. Um, I'm not sure there's much else to. C Let me see if there's something interesting in the uh, in the statement parsing. But really, um, most of it is extremely straightforward. There 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 shouldn't be any surprises. Uh, I guess I should mention maybe one thing that's kind of notable is that um, as a convenience for a lot of this stuff, I use stretchy buffs when I'm accumulating a variable number of nodes. So if I'm parsing an expression a statement block, which is, you know, it's like something like this, like a standard C-like thing, um, the result of that involves an arbitrary number of statements. And so you need some sort of dynamic allocation to handle the general case. And in addition, because you're doing recursive parsing, you can't use a single, for example, you can't use like a single uh, global buffer that that everyone, you know, that you assume you're the sole proprietor of because uh, nested functions that you call could also be filling that in and so on. So you need to be a little more, you need to use either a stack oriented allocator or you need to use something else. We'll, we'll do a stack allocator later, but for now I'm just using uh, stretchy buffs to accumulate them, and this is using um, the system allocator for now for, for each of these. But one thing that's notable is the buffer that ends up being accumulated from the stretchy buff loop that just you know parses a list of statements and push, puts them into a stretchy buff is that by the, when I actually construct the result, I don't directly return the stretchy buff. I actually do a, a tight allocation uh, of exactly the stuff we, we parsed um, with this way. So this is a pattern you'll see throughout the code. I call AST dupe. St dupe stands for duplicate. So it's like stir dupe and C where it, it duplicates the value but, but allocates a new copy. And so it's duplicating it in the context of the AST, meaning the AST is going to be the owner of this duplicated version. And it says, you know, here's the data we want to duplicate. Here's the size of the data. So I added a new function called size of to buff, which just gives you the, you know, the number of bytes in the buffer. Um, so it means that, you know, this is basically saying duplicate the buffer, um, and here are the number of elements, um, that are, that are, that were in the buffer. So you'll see this pattern recur over and over, um, in the code. So we accumulate it essentially using a temp buffer. And like I said, once we optimize all this stretchy buffer stuff, we'll actually use a temp allocator, which, uh, only the, is only really live for the duration of the parse. Then once the parse is complete, we will throw away that whole temp arena that contains all those temporary allocations. Um, and we will only retain the permanent uh, allocations associated with the AST. And so doing it this way, uh, if we go over to this function, you can see we have two allocations fun functions. We have AST alloc, which is what all these different AST constructors call directly. Um, this, I'll call it, cover this in a sec, but this allocates out of, uh, of, a, of a, a local arena, a local memory region uh, called AST arena so that all these allocations uh, come out of the same mostly contiguous area of memory, which also has a coherent lifetime. So everything out of that arena shares the same lifetime. So that's for the expression nodes, but also when we're uh, allocating these variable length structures and we do the duplication, um, uh, 
it comes out of that same arena. So that's the idea here. Um, so that's the pattern you'll see. Um, and again, to compare to alternative approaches, the way I've, mo I've actually done things in, in the past and which I think is more common is to use linked list structures um, for doing variable linked lists of stuff for things like uh, function call arguments and statement lists and statement blocks. And the reason it's convenient to do that is that you can kind of construct them incrementally and you don't have to do this dynamic buffer growth. Um, but the way we're doing it here, we kind of construct things with these stretchy buffs as temp buffers, but then once we're actually, we know how much we need, we make a tight allocation um, of, of just that. And we put it next to the other allocations that are relevant. So, so that's something I should mention about this whole arena thing. Uh, there's a bunch of technical motivations for having separate arenas. One of them is that you can make allocation much faster. Um, uh, and, one, and the reason you can make allocation much faster is that when you're allocating out of an arena, you're mostly just incrementing a pointer through a big chunk of con consecutive memory. Um, this has two effects. The first is that, and I, I can show you the code for this. Um, I'm just kind of pushing the stack for the digression. Hopefully people can keep up. Um, the fast path of the arena allocator is really just to say, hey, uh, does the requested size fit within the current arena block? And if it does, then we just um, don't worry about the alignment for now. We just really return that pointer and, and bump the pointer up by the requested size. And so in the in the common case, when you're doing an AST node allocation, really all you're doing is you're just incrementing a pointer. Um, and so it's, it's, it's extremely cheap. There's no heavy weight sort of processing going on to find a block of memory that fits the request. It's really just bumping a pointer. Uh, and the same is true for this AST dupe. It comes out of the same arena. Um, but yeah, so aside from just making allocation fast and kind of um, binding the lifetimes together, binding the lifetimes of those different individual allocations together into a bigger unit, one really nice feature, especially for AST parsing and processing, is that the order in which nodes are allocated, um, which is, follows the, uh, the, the recursive structure of the parser, corresponds very closely to the order in which the subsequent passes are going to traverse the data. Um, so, and in fact, the, if, if the, the, you don't necessarily have to understand this, but try to think about it if you're interested. The reason that's true is exactly the reason you can do a one pass compiler in the first place that uh, fuses parsing and code generation and type checking. Because the fact that you can fuse all of those things means that they're kind of consuming the data in the same order. Um, and because of that, if you use this kind of linear arena uh, for your allocations, it also means that if you do the same kind of traversal that you would do in a one-pass compiler, you're going to be consuming the data in memory order, basically. And so uh, what that means is, well, two things. First off, it, just in terms of cache coherency, it's good, but even better than just cache coherency, um, you have the ability to prefetch because when you're doing a lot of linear fetching, it's almost like a mem copy where even if the next uh, cache line is not necessarily um, would otherwise be in say L1 cache by the time you read it in your code, the fact that you're ac accessing things linearly means that uh, the cache unit in the CPU uh, is like, oh, I could prefetch, I'm, I'm going to prefetch the next block. And it's going to do that uh, hopefully all the way up the, ca the memory hierarchy. And so, uh, Eventually, we'll profile this with VTune to see how much of that theory is panning out. But in theory, what that should mean is that you're not going to be latency limited uh, on this stuff. Um, you're, you should mostly be bandwidth limited because it's totally prefetchable as long as you're doing the, uh, I guess, a post, let's see, a post order. As long as you're doing a post order traversal of the AST, it should be totally prefetchable and you should not really be latency limited, even though things are not initially in L1 cache or L2 or whatever. Um, so that's one of the potentially non-obvious benefits of using arenas here. It's not just a matter of of, of, the, of you know speeding up allocations and segregating allocation lifetimes. It's also really linearizing memory for subsequent traversals. And now, not every traversal we do will be that kind of linear traversal. You know, for example, in order to do order-independent declarations, there will be some of the processing that's kind of random access based on the dependency structure rather than the source uh, source order. Um, but for most of the heavyweight processing, uh, it's actually going to be linear. And so even though there's some random access jumping around, most of the processing is going to be linear and this should give a very nice boost. So um, that 
that was sort of a digression. I'm just sort of pushing the stack and popping the stack as I see stuff that I want to talk about. Um, what time is it? Okay, we're 50 minutes in. I might do 10 minutes. I might have a shorter stream today, so maybe 10 minutes more, uh, and then I'll do Q&A, and maybe we'll do a longer Q&A since there's a lot of new stuff here, and, and this may be easier to talk about what people want to know about. Um, let's talk about some changes to existing code as well. So if you recall, originally, um, uh, originally we just did name parsing um, without recognizing keywords. So keywords are things like if, return, while, const, var, all of these reserved words. Um, and so we had to, we had to make uh, an accommodation for, now, now, now that we have a real parser, we had to make an accommodation for, for keywords. And so really the only change to the lexer, at least at this level, is that there's a new function called isKeywordStir, where after interning the name, you can check whether it's a keyword or a non-keyword name, and we have different token types for those. Um, to make it easy to distinguish in the parser, you could have you you could have chosen to make all of these have the same token kind, but now you would have to constantly validate that you're not, for example, treating a reserved word as a variable name in a context that's expecting a variable name. Uh, so this is probably the right point where, at which to make the distinction. But also know that we don't make a finer distinction in kinds. Uh, you could have chosen to have a separate uh, token kind for every single reserved word. Um, but that kind of proliferates the number of token kinds and uh, why not just factor out the repeated structure? So that's what I did. Um, if you go up to the top of the file, you'll see all the stuff for, for keywords. The way keywords are handled is there's a global set of, of intern string pointers and then some, some auxiliary stuff here. Um, and one time you have to initialize those intern pointers. You can only do it once. Um, and it basically just interns all of them. Um, and there's a subtlety here for the arenas, so maybe I'll defer that until we cover the arenas. Um, but anyway, uh, the, the rough idea is we make sure that all of the string data for all these reserved words is allocated out of the same con consecutive chunk of memory and nothing else is intermingled with them, which means that if someone gives you a string pointer and you want to see whether it's a keyword or just a, an arbitrary name, you can actually just do a memory address comparison to see whether it falls in that memory range from the first uh, keyword uh, data to the last keyword data. Uh, and you can see that I'm basically validating that everything we uh, implicitly allocated during the interning came out of the same consecutive arena block by looking at the end pointer, which is going to change if you reallocate an arena block, and then you know validating that it hasn't changed once we're done interning everything. And then we set up these intervals and we set, say that we've been init, so we only do this once. Um, so that's basically it for keyword handling. Um, but yeah, while we're here, let's maybe go and see how interning changed a little bit uh, in order to accommodate this. So if you go over to the intern stuff, it's basically the same as before, but the difference is that rather than using the system allocator for, um, rather than using the system allocator for, uh, like I think we just used to have X malloc here, but now we have arena alloc. Now we have a separate memory region uh, just for string data. And so all the string data that we allocate as part of interning is going to be um, broken into a bunch of, 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 of big chunks. Uh, and uh, this, is, this is nice for just kind of consolidating these, this specific type of data um, and the lifetime and so on. Uh, but it also means that we can do stuff like the thing I just described where uh, we can control the layout of the data uh, in order to recognize uh, keywords. So that's sort of a benefit, but I would have done the arena allocation anyway, but doing it this way meant that we had a, a nicer way of recognizing keywords. Um, okay, let's actually talk about the arenas in detail. So an arena allocator is, the way I'm writing it, it's a way of, um, of having, it, it, it does a couple of things, like I said. It's, it's first off a way of organizing your, your allocations into, um, into different groups of lifetimes. So for the AST construction, a given parsing, uh, all the AST nodes are going to have the same lifetime. They're all part of the same um, cluster. Uh, and so it's a, part of way, it's a part of just organizing the lifetimes like that. So you can easily free them as a unit, for example, once someone is done with them. Um, but it's also a way, and this, this is, Normally, the main reason people use arena allocators 
uh, it's also a way of amortizing the cost of doing lots of small allocations especially so whether it is t nodes they're often going to be like you know 32 bytes or something like that and we're going to be doing a ton of them like a given line of code might may uh, end up allocating four to ten uh, or more uh, AST nodes. And so having to go back to the system allocator for every every single one of those is going to be uh, pretty slow. It's not really designed to make that use case especially fast. Um, and so this is, this is one way. There's other ways uh, of doing these custom allocators, but here's a simple way of doing an allocator that helps with that. And the basic premise is um, because I'm testing, I'm using smaller blocks, but typically you would use, a, this is a one megabyte uh, block size. Typically you would use a, some, some large block size like one megabyte. Uh, and then the idea is you only ask the system allocator, which is the potentially fairly slow one, you only ask it for big chunks of memory uh, sporadically. So only when you run out of your own block, uh, do you ask for another big block. Um, and so, you know, basically the arena starts out empty with no memory assigned to it. And then the first allocation is going to prompt the allocation of a one megabyte block or however big the block size is. But then for all the subsequent allocations that can, uh, until we run out of that one megabyte, you can see that um, allocation is extremely cheap. We do a comparison based on the remaining capacity. Uh, if we're over capacity, then we need to grow it, but that's just like with our buffer grow function. This is on the slow path, so this happens very rarely. Um, but normally we just do a well-predicted branch and we, we grab the pointer that's going to be a return value and then we bump the pointer based on the requested size and there's a subtlety here about alignment um, to make sure that all the uh, pointers we return are aligned to, in this case, eight bytes, but you could make it 16 or, or even smaller if you're just allocating, uh, if you have an arena that just has char buffer data. Uh, like our, our string arena. But anyway, the idea is that the fast path has a well-predicted, very cheap branch uh, and just really returns a pointer. And even this stuff here, which updates the pointer, even that is not on the dependency chain for the person doing the allocation. Um, so really, in terms of, if you think of the dependency structure of this code on an out of order processor, you don't, you don't have to know this stuff, but if you do, really all it's doing is, it's really only this thing here. It has to, to read this uh, current arena pointer, which is mostly going to be like an L1 cache and an inner loops that are doing a lot of allocations. It may end up being register allocated if the arena allocator function is inlined. So this is really, really fast. Um, and you can make it, you can amortize the cost of the per allocation cost even more by making the block size bigger. But one megabyte is sort of a good chunk. Um, but like I said, a subsidiary benefit for, for our AST use case is also that the allocations we do end up uh, linearly consecutive. And so if we end up parsing them uh, later, processing them later rather, in the same construction order, hence allocation order, then we get uh, memory linearity benefits. So this is, um, this is about the simplest arena style allocator I could write. Uh, and this is even including the asserts, but I think it's like 30 lines. Um, one thing that's a little bit unorthodox about it is because it's convenient, I chose to use stretchy buffs to store the link of blocks that we've allocated in an arena. Uh, normally people would use a header in each arena block and they would have a link list, embedded link list pointer uh, that, that goes, uh, that threads through all of the blocks. And then rather than doing an array style loop here, you would do a link list style loop here. Um, the nice thing about that is you don't have to have a secondary allocation just to hold the block pointers. But on the other hand, um, since we're not really trying to minimize the absolute number of allocations, like th this whole thing in general is already going to reduce the number of allocations in our program drastically because you know each arena is probably going to have one block, uh, one allocation for the block array because it's going to allocate 16 room for 16 blocks the first time through and that's like 16 megabytes and that's probably more than you'll need for most asts and so you're only going to have one of those and then you're going to have one allocation for each uh, megabyte used and so across the whole program you know we should end up with on the order of like 30 allocations even if we're allocating hundreds of megabytes with this kind of scheme um, so that was a, a very fast paced uh, explanation of, of what this is doing um, Go and study this code if you've never seen anything like this before. Um, you can see I factored out stuff into these macros for doing alignment. Uh, I hate it when people do this stuff in line. The, the math for this is not very hard. Um, uh, I, I don't want to explain the math for doing alignment. This is just rounding things up and down to multiples of the alignment 
um, but it's doing it only for powers of two where you can do the math much faster. But if you haven't worked through the math for this before, I encourage you to just write down the binary expansions of a bunch of different numbers and look at what this bitwise math works out to. And it's very easy to see that this basically um, does the right thing. So this, for example, masks out the, uh, less, the, the, the lower bits corresponding to the rounding. Uh, and this rounds up by first adding, you know, to, to, to push it into the new uh, interval, it, it first adds something and then rounds down and so on. And then you have these pointer variants that are just doing pointer casting around it to make them convenient. But anyway, that's the arena. Um, we, we might do a fancier version later, but my general approach with this is to do the simplest thing that satisfies our goals for now. Uh, and then we, we can iterate on this if it turns out that uh, there's a good reason to change it, but I'm actually I actually think this is a pretty good like if you want to sort of uh, not really memorize, but if you want to learn a simple memory allocator to, uh, to that you can write in a five minutes that you can drop into any code base for a use case like this, something along these lines is a good thing to have in your pocket. So um, if if that's uh, tantalizing, you know, please study it and make sure you understand everything. And hopefully it doesn't have any bugs, but I'm sure it does. But uh, at least I tested it for our use cases for now and uh, we'll improve it over time. All right. Um, I think that's what I wanted to cover. Um, let's go to Q&A and uh, take it from there. There's probably going to be a bunch of questions. Um, Let's see, I'm just scrolling through backlog. Um, if, if I uh, if I missed any questions, I'm going to try to find them, but if I missed your question, please repeat it because it's uh, it's it's easy to miss. Um, boom, boom, boom. Let's see here. Um, people are commenting, but not asking questions so far. Oh yeah, uh, Sean is saying that arenas also make freeze very cheap. I mean, that's, I guess, I guess it's sort of the flip side, uh, right? Is that um, there's a one-to-one -one relationship between number of allocations and number of freeze. And so if you want to freeze stuff eventually, uh, that, that helps as well, for sure. Um, and I should also mention one thing. I've had some kind of fly-by, drive-by comments uh, for some of my earlier streams where people were saying, why are you doing these small scale allocations with malloc? As you can see, if you, as, as long as you're not a total doofus, it's pretty easy to structure your code so that you can refactor it to use custom allocators later. Um, and so in most cases, I wouldn't go crazy with custom allocation up front. Just as long as you have it in your back of your head that you should structure your code in a way that doesn't sort of expose where, where you don't have a, a thousand places that are doing X malloc or malloc manually, then you can always do this stuff later. Um, and the good thing about it is you won't have to debug two things at, at once. You'll have a reliable system allocator that you can use to confirm stuff works. And then you can um, can switch it out later when when your code is working. And then you can just, just the allocator with your new code rather than trying to get 10 things working at once, which is a, a bad uh, design style, in my opinion. You should always try to uh, write things in an order where you only are testing things. Uh, even if you know you're going to need it, try to write code so that you can test one thing. Uh, so, so only one thing has significant uncertainty about its correctness at once, and then swap other pieces out as you gain confidence in the earlier pieces. Uh, the only case where I would caution against that is if it, re it requires major rewrites and you have to do things properly up front. But um, in general, if you're if you're experienced enough to be able to think ahead about what might be required, then don't prematurely optimize about this stuff. Just make sure that you don't make irreversible commitments that that, that will screw you in the future. Sometimes you'll have to uh, reverse and, and redo stuff, but in general, the right way to do optimization is to think think enough ahead that you know what the issues will be, but not to actually do the optimization if it can be deferred. Um, and so that's what we do here. And, and this will also receive additional work. Like for example, the buff, uh, the buffers are still using the system allocator, uh, like X malloc, but uh, it, it's very easy to turn this into a stack allocator that we temporarily, like, for example, you could have, um, you, you, you could have like, um, you know, you could have something like this, um, as a global, uh,
and uh, and then have uh, the stretchy buffer use those for allocation and freeing. And then when we enter our parser, we uh, temporarily set this to use a, um, a stack allocator. Like a stack allocator is, it's essentially like a linear allocator, like for an arena. But um, but 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 in, in our case, since uh, the temporary allocations, unlike the AST as a whole, are pretty bounded in size, we could actually use a fixed size temp allocator. And uh, the allocation is just going to be bumping the pointer. We never have to reallocate. And freeing is just going to be resetting the pointer to a certain mark. And so that way, um, we don't have to just do append only allocations for stack style uh, enter exit where we allocate a bunch of stuff and then we return. We can free that and the cache is warm and so on and so on. Um, so, so stuff like that is easy to add later. And I knew that it was easy to add later when I wrote this code. And that's why uh, I just use the system allocator and knowing that I can swap stuff out uh, without breaking the existing code later. All right. So let's see what else people said. Someone was asking about what AST dupe is. I think I explained it, but basically it's uh, it's sort of like uh, stir dupe in the standard library in that it takes a certain amount of data. I guess you would call this memdupe maybe. Uh, it takes a certain amount of data with a given size, allocates in the AST arena memory for it and then copies it over. So basically this is used for when we're accumulating our variable length temporary buffers, this is used to make them permanent and, and put them into the AST arena alongside all the other data that's uh, relevant. All right. Um, Let's see here. Does my parser grammar actually handle the size of case? Uh, yeah, so currently I'm not handling size of. Um, so actually, let me implement that so you see how quickly we can add something like that. So um, there's going to be a size of expression type. Um, and um, what auxiliary data is going to have, it, it can either be um, I, I guess we need to know whether it's a type. So, so basically depending on it, it could be either a type spec or an expression. So we need to know whether it's um, I should probably have an enum for that, even though two two element enums like it's a good convention to 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 have them, but it always makes me feel like I should just use a boolean. Um, um, so something like this, and then in the. Uh, So that's it for the node. Um, then we need to have the constructors. And so Um, so that's E size of expert kind size of expression size of expression expression and then this and then but yeah I'm happy I left that out now because now I can show how easy it is to do this stuff uh, and it won't take more than five minutes max so um, so you put in this type and then you say okay that parses and then you have to go and actually add it to the grammar. And I assume it would go in the base case along with all the other parse expression base. Um, or operand. So let's say else if match keyword uh, size of keyword. I think I have, okay, so that, yeah, that's fine. So if we have a size of keyword, um, then uh, 
um, let's require parentheses on like C. I never liked how C did that. Uh, and then we're essentially going to do the same kind of thing here where we're going to see if there's a colon. Uh, and if there is, um, we will consume it. And then expect this. And then we'll say expert size of type type else. Um, we will just recursively parse an expression. And then let's test it. Oh, and we have to add ST printing to it as well. So um, print expr. If e size of expression kind uh, size of expression else this thing must be type oh God did I delete some stuff so this is a uh, expression. And then in one case, we just print an expression. In the other case, we print a type. All right, let's print type spec. The reason it's called type spec rather than type is that to me, type is a semantic thing. Uh, a type spec is really something that, does, that specifies a type. Um, so I sometimes call it type in the context where it's clear that uh, like these fields where it's a syntactic context, but I don't want to have a global type, a global struct called a called type because uh, that's it's not a type, it's a type spec. It, it, it denotes a type, it isn't a type. Um, so that's it for the printing. And then we have to add a test case and um, we will say size of 42, which is an expression. I mean, you could also do one plus two. Uh, let's see if that works. I'm just going to add this to the top so that if there's a issue, we can step through it. So that worked. And let's do a case with um, something like this, or uh, sorry, uh, int32 or int pointer array of 16, something like this. Just put that for a second, see it. And that works too. So uh, thank you, Sean, for being my uh, what, what do you call it the, the person in the, the person in the audience that helped that's helping set you up uh, because I think that was a good illustration of how easy it is to incorporate new stuff. All right. Um, Someone's asking, for the trick you're using to tell if a string is a keyword or range testing, are you relying on them being in the same arena block? Yeah, so I'm I, I'm relying on them being in the same arena block, and I'm actually asserting it. Um, so normally, the idea is that you would only call this once it's startup. And so you know, eventually, we're going to make this arena be kind of internal, so it doesn't conflict with general global interning. Um, but because of productivity, I, you know, I'm just kind of using the global string interner, where in theory, um, this block could not be big enough by the time we start allocating into it uh, to accommodate all of them in the same block. But uh, I'm, I'm at least asserting that that it works out. Um, but um, once we tighten up the interning uh, and, and make it more sort of specific to the to the lexer, uh, this will be 100%. Like there won't be any potential interference from user code like that. Um, and again, I think this is a good example. Things like string interning and stretchy buffs are really a productivity tool. And often once things start uh, consolidating and, and solidifying and, and stabilizing, uh, you, you often want to go in and uh, customize it a little bit. And so we will do that. But right now we're just using a shared uh, string arena and then asserting that things behaved as expected 
Um, but in general, this could break if someone was doing interning, you know, right up until the end of the one megabyte block, and then we start doing them and it reallocates and now they're no longer consecutive. Um, So I'm saying, so it's a question about threads that doesn't really make sense to me. Um, let's see. All right. So any more questions? Um, I'm going to uh, push this code. While I'm waiting to see if people have more questions. Oh. Let's test that it works on Linux. <clears throat> and it does. Oh, someone's saying there's an occasional audio delay that I can fix by updating OBS to 21.1. All right, I, I will definitely do that. Um, someone's asking, did you learn this from books uh, and experimenting on your own? Um, I mean, the answer is both, right? Like, I think the, the you, 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 a lot of the basic stuff you can learn from books, and I think some books are better than others, but you can't expect books to tell you kind of everything A to C, right? Like, you, I, I think one, com, one pet peeve I have is people often complain about books as being, you know, they're too theoretical or whatever, but it's kind of missing the point that uh, it's not necessarily the job of a book to tell you everything, right? Like it's your job to put it into context and to apply it. And so I think, yeah, all of this stuff, I, at some point, I'm sure most of the pieces I picked up from books, but in terms of a lot of this practical uh, code-based stuff, like it's sort of like, how do I structure the code and whatnot? A lot of it is based on first off writing parsers in lots of languages, not just C. So once you've seen what a clean parser looks like in Haskell or ML, you kind of have an idea of what you're missing in C when it comes to, for example, overly statement-oriented code for AST construction versus more expression-oriented code. And so you can start to see how can I import some of those conventions. So that's one thing. If you, uh, if you can kind of look at parsers and languages that are maybe more accommodating for writing compilers and then try to import those conventions, that's a good way to learn. The other is just reading code. I spend a lot of time looking at existing code and have for at least the, I would say the last 15 years. So, you know, uh, I, I look at existing code bases and the thing about reading existing code is that uh, it, it doesn't have to be good overall necessarily for you to pick up stuff. So you can pick up uh, tips and tricks from random snippets and just kind of file them in the back of your head and then see if you can incorporate them. So most of this stuff is not really copied from one source or template, but it's just over the years, picking up on lots of ideas and putting them together and kind of making them my own. Um, but I mean, most of this stuff is not really unorthodox, I guess. Um, so so th I guess that would be my advice. You have to do everything and you have to learn to put everything together. That's where people are go wrong. Like for example, if you're someone who is really good at coming up with stuff on your own, but you never look at what other people do, um, there's a chance you come up with something totally different, but there's also a good chance that you're not doing everything optimally and that you're missing out on stuff because uh, unless you're like a lifetime compiler person, if you're just an occasional compiler person, uh, chances are you're not going to get, uh, even as a very smart programmer, a very good person coming up with new ideas, chances are you're not gonna uh, get everything perfect uh, on your own. So do everything, learn from other people, read books, obviously do your own coding, iterate, learn from your mistakes. Um, um, try different approaches to see how it works, try different languages, see if you can apply ideas from different languages to your language of choice, right? Like just because it's C doesn't mean that, uh, for example, the expression oriented style that I use for parsing an AST construction can't be imported if you just do things right. So yeah, like a B, I guess, learn from everything. Don't, don't learn from, from one thing. Um,
is there's no that, that's a little too embarrassing for, for what it's worth i don't consider myself a, a very uh special programmer i i think i have a certain style of stuff that i like to work on and it works well for some things but it doesn't work well at other things so i guess i can answer the question that way is that um I like I like stuff like this. I like I, I think I've become pretty good at systems level design and implementation, but I have to be able to pick the problem space. Uh, if you give me an arbitrary problem, uh, I will probably not be super productive, and I'll probably be fairly unhappy, and code will suffer as a result. So if I get to pick my problems, uh, I can often make things work. So I guess maybe that's the the key is being able to pick your problem and uh, learning to exploit that. Um, to, to build sort of things, things in a simple way. But uh, I don't consider myself very special at anything. I consider myself bad at a lot of things, but I don't consider myself especially good at anything. <clears throat> All right. Let's see how we're doing on time. So almost at the one, one and a half hour mark. So I guess I'll do one or two more questions before we shut down. Uh, someone's asking, have I ever developed an operating system uh, I've developed pieces of operating systems. I've done simple kernels uh, for for home stuff. I've worked on some OS stuff at work, um, but I mean, I haven't I haven't done a complete stack the way we're doing. For almost everything we're doing, this is actually true even for the compiler. I think it's fair to say that by the time the Ion compiler is done, it will probably be the most production quality compiler I've ever written, because I I've worked on all the pieces. I know how I want to put them together. But part of the fun for me for this project is that I get to put all the pieces together and I'm pretty confident that I can do all the pieces and I can also do the systems design. But I haven't done most of the things I'm doing here completely end to end in exactly the way I'm doing it. So that's also a way for me to keep it interesting. If I was just repeating stuff I've done before, this would be pretty boring for me, honestly. So uh, I've, I've done, I think almost everything I'm promising to do in the overview doc on uh, the Bitwise repo. I've done basically all the pieces to varying, various extents. Stuff related to compilers I've done pretty heavily, um, but I've never done exactly the kind of compiler we're doing here, kind of end-to-end -end in a way that I expect people to use it and have good regression testing and all this other stuff. So this will probably be my first, you know, quote-unquote production quality compiler once we're done. Uh, and, and the OS even more so. Done simple stuff, done simple microcontroller class, uh, you know, task switching microkernels, done simple PC OS sort of DOS class um, with mode 13 and basic, you know, IDE hard drive and all that stuff, BIOS, um, but haven't done exactly what we're doing. But again, I, I kind of know my knowledge gaps and I have good models in mind for how we want to do things. A lot of it is going to be inspired by existing systems. So most of the stuff is not like things I came up with on my own. It's putting together pieces I learned from elsewhere and, and so on. All right. Someone saying, I saw designated initializers used, so MSVC supports them now. Yeah, as of Visual Studio 2015, uh, MSVC has pretty uh, pretty decent um, C99 support. I think it basically has all the features except for stuff like type generic math and type generic macros in general. But the stuff that I care about, which is designated initializers and compound literals, uh, that stuff has been supported since VS 2015. So finally, you can actually use something resembling modern C uh, on Windows if you're using MSVC. So that was a joyous occasion. And unfortunately, using this leaves some people behind that are stuck to pre-2015 Visual Studio compilers. But uh, honestly, <clears throat> I find like um, it's almost indescribable how much of a quality of life improvement it was to be able to use these features. So uh, there's no way I'm going back. Uh, so unfortunately, we're stuck on VS 2015 or later, or playing our GCC on Windows. You can use as well. All right. Oh yeah, someone's also saying we uh, MSVC support in in Visual Studio doesn't yet have variable length arrays. I never use variable length arrays. If I want to do that, I use alloc a. And even with alloc a, I normally don't use it because it's pretty unsafe, I think. Um, or if I use it, I use it in a very limited way. Uh, so I never use variable length arrays. I don't think they're useful, to be honest. I don't understand why they're in the language. <clears throat> Just use alloc a. Do an aligned version of alloc a, right? If you had an aligned version of alloc a, so you could easily do aligned stack allocations of arbitrary data. Uh, I don't see what 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 variable arrays VLAs give you beyond that. Um, but maybe I'm missing something. But it seems to me like a language feature that didn't need to exist for a systems language. 
Um, does Clang have any issues with C99? No, Clang, uh, Clang has really good support for both C99 and C11. Actually, I want to mention one C11 feature that we're using, but it's universally supported, so it's not necessarily a big deal. Um, but if you look at all the AST code, I use variable or I use anonymous unions. Those are those have been supported in almost all C compilers uh, for for decades. I mean, I don't know how long, but for a very long time, for almost as long as I can remember. Um, but they only became a standard C feature in C11, and so uh, we use those. That's a one. That's the one C9, C9, C11 feature we use. But since it's supported on the compilers that anyone uses, um, it's not really a compatibility barrier. All right. Um, maybe that's it, and we will start to wind down. One last question, two last questions, and then we're done. Any code questions, any conceptual questions, any random questions? Happy to answer them, and then I'll, I'll finish off. Oh, that's interesting. So I so I screwed up. Uh, mall assign. Oh, okay. Thank you. That's called a copy and paste bug. Uh, that is a good catch. Thank you, sir. All right. Yeah. Hope. Hope people are, are are pretty happy with the code progress. Like I, I think I am. Um, it's kind of a good example of what I want to be able to do when I'm not um, spending my whole day uh, doing other stuff that's related to Bitwise, but not necessarily coding. Um, and hopefully, it also allays fears that it's just going to be super slow paced with me waddle, uh, with, with me rambling on stream, but not getting anything done. I think uh, you know this is 2,500 lines of code in two days. That's pretty good. That's about my max. Uh, probably not going to be sustainable, but if we can keep up a good tempo, uh, I'm pretty confident we'll be able to hit our goals long term. Someone's saying, well, I'll answer that question on the forum uh, because <clears throat> all right, I think I'll, uh... oh God, did I forget? Oh, I did record. I always worry that I forgot to record. I guess I always have the, the Twitch archive in, in the worst case, but uh, anyway, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to stop streaming now. I'm not going to do an after stream today since I just want to work on stuff. Um, but hopefully that was uh, that was pretty fun. And uh, remember, we're we're doing every day, every other day. So I won't be doing a stream tomorrow unless I decide to do a bonus stream. So last stream of this week will be two days from now, same time as, as today. So uh, thanks for coming by, and uh, hopefully you picked up some some new new tricks. And uh, I encourage you to study the code if this is unfamiliar, and and uh, if you have questions after studying it, you know, ask on the Discord, ask on the forums. People are happy to help. I'm happy to help. So uh, thanks for coming by, and I will see you in two days.